All right, guys, today we are going to be talking about winter survival knife priorities or ultimately how to choose a good knife for winter survival. This is something I've talked about before, but today we're actually gonna be talking about it specifically, like breaking it down in the attributes that you want to look for in a winter survival knife. And today we're gonna be going over this knife um, in a way, we're not so much talking about it, but in videos like this where I invariably make one knife the center topic Everyone always asks me what the knife is, so this is in particular the Demco Free Rain. But I want to make this note that while I do like the Demco Free Rain, I do think it is genuinely a good um, survival knife, obviously. So I'm covering it in this video. I do want to note that there are plenty of other options, things like the Cold Steel SRK on the lower or mu more budget end, even things like the Mora um, Konsbul is another good option or variant to go with, or actually a lot of the more knives like the Garberg um, are also good qualifiers for this um, kind of pattern and for this um, like a lot of the qualifiers for this are found in many of Mora's knives um, but the Demco knife the cold or Demco free rain I should say the cold steel SRK is another good one looking at more high-end knives or more expensive knives most of Falkneven's kind of base level or core products also fall into this and so what I mean by this is the A1 the S1 the F1 also are good candidates for this as well so Realistically, this video is going to be focusing and talking about or going over the features of the Demco Free Rain and why it's a good winter survival knife, but there are plenty of other good options out there as well. Anyways, guys, now let's jump into what makes a good wintertime survival knife. So, like I said, because it is wintertime now for many people, myself included, it is always good to go over and review nice or ultimate good properties for winter time or winter wilderness blades. So the first one for me, and I think one of the biggest and most important factors for what makes a good winter time wilderness survival and bushcrafting knife is a fully rubberized handle. Now, what I mean by this is a fully rubberized handle should be something that has a fully encapsulated um, handle where either you do not have a tang sticking out, as you can see with this knife it does actually have a tang sticking out a lot of your fault nevens are this way as well and this isn't necessarily a problem but you either have a fully encapsulated handle with just the tang of the blade sticking out or you don't have the tang sticking out at all in the case of the cold steel srk you don't have a tang sticking out and in the case of many moras you don't either but it's not a huge deal if you do have the tang sticking out because this is not really a high contact area but you want a fully encapsulated handle and this is where majority of survival knives actually kind of fall off because most typical knives and what we think of as survival knives that are full tang will have basically a sandwich styled handle construction so that means you have two handle slabs of varying thicknesses and they are either pinned screwed uh, either glued on you know sometimes whatever um, but they're basically two handle slabs glued drilled screwed whatever onto the handle and you have those on there and you still have a bare tang that runs the circumference of your handle now this initially doesn't necessarily seem like a huge issue and it isn't always a deal breaker but if you ever need to remove your hands from gloves or mittens to do any cutting or fine tasks having that stick of steel around can make holding your knife incredibly comfortable or uncomfortable I should say and incredibly um, chilly. So that is why on any good survival knife for wilderness wintertime applications, you will see a fully encapsulated handle. This is also a reason why on a lot of Falkneven models and a lot of knives that are made in the north um, areas, such as Falknevens and Moras that are made in Scandinavia, you will see fully encapsulated handles, even on full tang knives. So I usually prefer rubber. It can be plastic, uh, like in terms of the Mora Garberg. However, either way you slice it, you want a fully encapsulated handle because that gives you maximum protection from any coldness or any cold soak that your steel blade is going to get. And so all steel will get cold in 
cold uh, times. And so what you really want is a fully encapsulated handle. This is really big. And once again, I prefer rubber for this because a lot of times when it comes to plastics or, you know, kind of harder polymer styled handles, it's not a huge deal, um, you know, in warmer temperatures when you're holding them with your bare hands. But in the winter time, you're often using things such as mittens or you're using things such as gloves and so having rubber means that even if you don't necessarily have the grippiness of your hand you're still going to get really good traction in addition the other really big um, thing is that of course if you're dealing with winter time you're almost always going to be encountering snow and snow likes to do one thing and that is melt and so of course when it turns into or when it melts it turns into water and water on polymers and plastics just really increases the slickness or the slipperiness whereas rubber tends to retain its grip even when wet or bloody so that is another really big pro to rubber handles <clears throat> So moving on to the next point. Now, this is a little bit more survival focused and that is the true focus of this video. That is that when it comes to the blade, you are going to optimally want at least a five inch blade, if not a little bit longer, and you are optimally going to want a fairly thick blade stock. Now, the reason why you're going to want these two things in particular is that you are going to likely have to do more industrial tasks with your knife. In times such as the winter, you're going to be focusing less on fine-tuned things like carving and things generally most of the time that require a thinner, more narrow profiled blade. So going with something that's 3 16 of an inch to a quarter inch, sometimes even more, thick gives you the ability to chop and baton with greater efficiency. And that's really what it all comes down to. It isn't so much that the knife is the best chopper or the best batoning um, tool. However, if you have a blade that has, once again, a 3 16 to quarter inch thick piece of steel for its like stock, it's going to baton very well. It's going to chop very well because you're dealing with a higher um, mass. So it makes it easier to transfer energy. It also, as far as a wedge goes, when it's acting like a wedge, when you're batoning it through things, it is going to offer greater ability to split things apart. Now, on a well-crafted knife, there should be a good compromise, and this is why I particularly like the things like Falkneven's A1 and S1 for wintertime operations, and of course, the free reign here, and that is because it has a very high saber grind, and you'll also notice on the S1 and A1 from Falkneven, they have very high saber grinds that are convex and so what that means is that because you have a high grind it gives you a nice ability to have a thick stock tang so once again good chopping good splitting but also too because they have high grinds it narrows that thick stock down to a nice edge that can still do a lot of finer tasks such as feather sticking and carving so these aren't necessarily the types of knives that you want to process or skin a uh, squirrel with because these are not going to be the easiest thing to do that with however when it comes down to it that's why a lot of times especially in winter environments it's nice to have a nice robust you know winter time survival knife and then pairing that with something like a pocket knife that you can carry and use for more delicate delicate tasks so anyways we're getting a little bit off topic but ultimately having a thick robust blade that is a little bit on the longer side and once again I would say a minimum of five inches if not longer pushing six seven inches is going to be really good because once again in survival especially you may be tool um, or resource limited or constrained so what that means is you may only have a knife and a saw or the resources around you may be large pieces of wood once again in a survival situation we kind of have to go into it with the most broad reaching scope of practice or ability is and because that is once again you may be in a place where there is lots of pine boughs and there are a lot of good resources for making quick fires or you may find yourself in a stand of birch trees where there's only reasonably large trees. You know, we're talking um, six inches in diameter or greater. So, so what I mean by, you know, a narrow um, resource slash tool, um, you know, kind of, you may be tool or resource deprived. I mean, that may not have tools 
or you might not be working with the most ideal resources. And this is just a small aside that a lot of people, especially people that I've encountered in real life, don't seem to understand about survival, is that when I talk about survival and recommend larger tools for survival, even though this one isn't particularly large, um, but when I usually rec recommend larger tools, it's for that reason. In, in survival, you don't always get the most ideal situations. I mean, another really good kind of um, side tangent on this is that there are many, um, say, gravel bars and smaller little islands on the rivers here in Alaska, and a lot of those islands are very resource sparse. So you may truthfully have to baton and break down driftwood to get to dry wood, to get to resources that you can use to craft fires, to stay warm, to dry out equipment. And these are all very realistic situations that have actually happened to people. And so a, a lot of people don't seem to factor in that there are other environments or situations that you can find yourself in that require tools that are capable of processing larger wood and more resource or not ideal resources, I should say. So less than ideal resources are a true factor to survival and they're a very real, very present thing that a lot of people like to sweep under the rug. Unfortunately, myself, I don't like to sweep those things under the rug, so that's why I recommend what I recommend. Anyways, so the last thing for me in most survival or wintertime survival situations, and kind of concluding this, bringing it to a conclusion, is that I really prefer stainless steels or at least rust resistant steels. Once again, this is an OS 10A blade, probably not the best or most premium. I would say something that would be a really, really solid option would be something like the CPM 3V version of the Cold Steel SRK. Very solid option and in fact one of my favorite knives out there. Um, penny for pound, probably one of the best survival knives that you can possibly buy is the Cold Steel SRK and CPM 3V. Um, but aside from that, you want something that pushes more semi-stainless to stainless. Of course, once again, something like CPM 3V is not the most res rust resistant, but I do think that it balances out a lot of things where it gives you superior toughness, superior wear resistance. So you do have to sacrifice a little bit of your um, end uh, rust resistance but you get so much other you know real world useful tangible benefits from having cpm 3v anyways aside from that you want something that is at minimum rust resistant or at least you know something that is reasonably corrosion resistant it doesn't necessarily have to be a pure stainless steel like os 10a but you want something that is going to be reasonably rust resistant and that is because in a real survival situation going into it with something that's like 1095 high carbon c100 high carbon um, any of your more traditional or more basic high carbon steels it is going to be very very difficult to keep them rust free in the winter and this is primarily due to the fact that in a true survival or wilderness setting and i've seen it in myself and my practices as well is that you will go out say you once again are procuring firewood for instance and you are batoning wood breaking it down you're going to likely be coming into contact with snow. Your tools will likely be brushed up or get snow in or on them somehow. And one of the worst parts is, is that a warm steel blade, if it's kept close to your body, will be above freezing, touches, um, <clears throat> It touches snow, snow becomes water, that water freezes onto your blade and then you go back into warm environments. That water then, or sorry, that ice becomes water and will lead to rust. This is what's happened to me quite a few times. And once again, it's one of those things that over the course of multiple days, like day one, day two, you might be able to stay on top of it. You might be able to keep your blade nice and clean. You know, you might be able to keep water off of it. But if you're going day after day after day, once again, potential hypothetical survival situations, you will eventually wear down. You will get sloppy. You will begin to just break down on your mentalities. And this is why similar to why I recommend bog like insulated bog boots when you are in freeze thaw types of winter situations and scenarios over something like mucklucks because mucklucks properly treated with snow seal can perform very well especially in high alpine environments but the mucklucks water impermeability is 
only as good as you keep it. And so once again, week after week or day after day, week after week, your ability or your mindset will eventually break down. You will get sloppy. You will eventually make a mistake. And that's why I like to have things that are foolproof or reasonably foolproof. Obviously too, there's no such thing as a stain proof steel. There's only stain less steels. So you want to keep your blades as clean as possible. But broadly speaking, if you start with stainless steels or steels that are corrosion resistant, then you are going to be better served. And once again, invariably, you will get sloppy, you will make mistakes, and those things will happen. So the optimal thing is creating an environment or setting yourself up for success, realizing that there will be mistakes. So anyways, these are just lessons that I've learned personally from operating in winter environments and survival and bushcraft um, scenarios and situations. And so this is just me trying to impart some of that knowledge. Anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. As always, God bless and I'm out.